I want to talk about R1, which was the new thinking model open source and released by DeepSeek today. But I want to talk about it strategically because this is happening a lot and I am tired of people being surprised. So at the end of the day, I want to lay out both the R1 model and I also want to lay out the strategy of each player in the room when it comes to how they approach AI and why. So we're going to go through them. First, DeepSeek. DeepSeek has done this before. They are in the habit of taking cutting edge releases specifically from OpenAI and releasing them later open source just as good and getting very cheap API costs along the way. Why would they do that? Why would it make sense? These are the guys that made a lot of headlines for saying DeepSeek V3, which is sort of a four class, Claude Sonic class kind of a model, was trained for $5 million. People debated whether that was true, but the point is it's much, much cheaper than the original cost to train chat GPT-4, which started the whole four class revolution. So at the end of the day, their strategy, whatever their actual training cost was, is to gain market share using their APIs, which are very cheap. If they can shift developers over to DeepSeek over time by providing more and more effectively equivalent intelligence, they're gonna be doing really well because developers are very cost sensitive and will be happy to move to a model in most cases that they can get for cheaper. And so to me, I would expect them to release O1 Pro copycat next. And as soon as there's another model that's more cutting edge, like O3, they're gonna start working on that. If there's something that another lab releases that is also cutting edge in a different way, maybe Anthropic comes out with something, maybe Google comes out with something, they'll work on a version of that too. Their whole strategy is to essentially come from behind, deliver cheap API costs and eat the market. So much for DeepSeek. Let's move to OpenAI. Why are they not more worried? This is a situation where intelligence costs are coming down in a matter of months. O1 is not a moat anymore. What do you do? Well, they're betting on two things. First, because DeepSeek is a Chinese model, they're betting that American corporations at scale will find that it's not secure to send their data to China and would prefer to keep their data in the US. Uh, and so they want to use a US made model. And so there's sort of an inherent advantage for OpenAI at that point. Second, they are betting on the exponential curve. At the end of the day, a little bit more time for them to work on a model, a little bit of a time advantage can translate to exponential performance gains. And so if you think about it, O3 can be substantially better than O1 in just a matter of months and O4 beyond that. And what they're betting on is that that exponential gain in intelligence is something that corporations will pay a premium to access over time. We'll see if they're right. But essentially what they're betting on is that there's disproportionate gains to be had for being an American company that lives at the cutting edge and that is able to continually deploy these extremely advanced models. And that eventually they will get into a point where they are using a recursive feedback loop to very, very rapidly improve these models. And that could potentially help them expand their lead. What's interesting is we see some signs of that already. There was a, a little leak that came out uh, in the last week that part of what made OpenAI so excited over Christmas and getting into New Year's is that they were able to use four different instances of O1 to rewrite their Transformers code base. I, it sounds like a movie, but it's not. It's the Transformer-based architecture that's at the heart of large language models. And they asked these O1 instances to look at the code base and see if they could make it more efficient. And they did, substantially. And if that's the case, then we are getting to a point where AI can help build AI, which means that for a company like OpenAI, if they are at the cutting edge, that feedback loop runs faster and allows them to gain an ever bigger advantage over time. That is probably the corporate bet they are making. Let's look at a couple of the other players though. Let's look at Google. What's Google's bet here? Google is playing defensively. At the end of the day, Google has a search position to maintain. Everything they've done for the last 20 years is about defending their search position and deploying a little bit of spare cash to bets. It's a very conservative corporate strategy, actually. It reminds me a lot of like a General Motors strategy. But if that's their play, why are they so hard in on open AI? And why are they so hard in on artificial intelligence, I should say? The reason they're pushing so hard on AI is because at the end of the day, they see this as a disruption to search. 
One of the things that uh, I was reading about is a CEO of a fairly large corporation saying off the record that he has seen the search funnel collapse with Google, where organic search for his corporation has just started to just erode and is like half of what it once was. Look, that's an anecdote, right? It's not that I'm saying search has gone away 50%, but I think if you're sitting there in Google's chair, you are worried about the long-term erosion of search because of AI. You're not really worried about AI tools like perplexity that just do search. What you're worried about is that people will use search on chat GPT instead over time. You're worried that at the end of the day, the act of searching is really about gaining knowledge. And if these AI models have the knowledge, why would you go to Google? And so they're desperately playing from behind to get the benefits of AI so that you stay on the google.com homepage and do your searches there. That's why they rushed so hard for those summaries, even though people laughed at them and said the summaries were terrible. That's why they rushed so hard to make sure that they're deploying on Google Cloud AI solutions corporations can trust. At the end of the day, if it's the same position with Google Cloud as it is with search. If corporations can't see AI solutions that they can trust and leverage within their own cloud footprint, they're going multi-cloud, they're going somewhere else for that AI. Amazon is actually similar. If you look at Amazon's position, they deployed 15,000 engineers and they built a timer. That's what Alexa is. Alexa is a smart timer. It was an open joke at Amazon. 15,000 engineers to build a smart timer. They missed the boat on large language models. They have been playing from behind. That is their incentive to work with Anthropic. That is why they are pushing so hard on their Tranium Silicon. They are desperate to regain a strategic advantage that allows them to maintain the margin leverage they have at AWS. That is what matters to them. And so they have to push hard on AI. That is why Jeff Bezos has gone back to work several days a week just reviewing AI six pagers. They have got to get back in the game. And from their perspective, if all they do is defend their current market share and continue to grow it the way they have been, they're doing okay. But I know Amazon because I used to work there and I know that they're hungrier than that. And so they're actually not going to be satisfied with just defending their position. They are going to insist that they eventually be able to take the number one slot in the AI world and they're going to keep innovating and or buying companies until they do. So we will see how that all plays out. That's their ambition. Right now, they're just trying to defend their market share the way Google Cloud is. And this, by the way, the, the cloud products is why they charge for these models. And that is why Zuckerberg and Meta do not charge for Llama because they're not a cloud company. They are a company that makes money off of ads sold to eyeballs. And so for them, if they can use these AI models and they can juice an ecosystem for free where developers know their model architecture and their ecosystem so they can pull in talent anytime they want, which is exactly what they did, by the way. You know the 5% riff they did for performance? It was explicitly to dump out the bottom 5% of the company and bring in fresh talent, which is really hard on morale, but it's really easy to do if you have an open source ecosystem that's that popular in Llama. You can just bring in developers that are already familiar with Llama, super easy. And that's what they're doing because their goal is to use that ecosystem to generate personalized feeds for the billions of people that use their products. So that instead of looking at friend generated content, you're gonna be looking at AI generated content and AI generated ads. And even if you feel weird about that and I feel weird about that, I guarantee you it's gonna perform well. Now they have pushed too hard in some cases. You saw the botched rollout of the avatars a couple of weeks ago where an avatar famously said I was out helping over Christmas at a food kitchen or something like there was some like charitable cause thing and everyone dunked on them and said, you're a made up avatar. What are you talking about? This is really offensive. That is just a bump in the road. They are coming back. They're going to do it again and they're going to do it again because it's really, really lucrative to increase the eyeball time in their app. That is what they're going for. So that's Meta's strategy. That's why Meta's open sourcing. That's why Google and Amazon are not. What about Microsoft? Microsoft is interesting because Microsoft has a cloud product, but they also have OpenAI in the fold. So they have two ways to win, which is part of why <laughs> Satya Nadella is doing so well these days. 
Uh, they win because they've defined a financial term for artificial general intelligence that means that OpenAI must cough up something like $100 billion in profits before AGI has been achieved. Which, by the way, if you saw Sam Altman today saying, tamp down the hype, we haven't built AGI, he can't say they have built AGI because it's a $100 billion statement. He can't say it. So, like, take it for, like, with a block of salt, right? Like, he's never going to say that because it's a corporate statement. Okay. What is Microsoft's game, though? Not only are they getting paid if OpenAI does well, which it will, they are also getting paid by taking the OpenAI models, deploying them in Azure, and selling them with the OpenAI label behind Azure. They're in a really good spot on that. And then they can pull the tech into the consumer side and all of that. That's a really good spot to be. You're defending your cloud business. You're pushing the OpenAI brand, which is the best known brand in AI at this point. And if OpenAI does well, you also make money that way. It's a good spot to be. So that's a quick tour of the different major players in the game, what they're thinking, why they're thinking it. DeepSeek made me want to do that because at the end of the day, if we don't understand the incentives, we're confused by the news. So there you go. Those are the strategic incentives. I hope this was a nice tour for you. Um, yeah, cheers.